thanks very much, Bobby. It's, it's never it's never easy following Lord Deven. Um, I, I should say I wanted to call my son, praise God, bare bones, but my wife vetoed it for some strange reason. Um, so I, uh, I was going to say something about Green Alliance and, and how, how we work. I guess like all, all think tanks, uh, we're about uh, landing policy ideas politically. So that, I guess, is what distinguishes us from academics. But I hope policy ideas that are firmly rooted in the evidence, and we do have a history of working closely with academic institutions and, and uh, um, organizations like CREDS and, and so on. Um, we are also uh, conveners of the environment sector and sometimes of, of businesses as well. And we work across a number of policy areas, uh, energy, industry, skills, circular economy, green finance, land and farming, and so on. So it's a, it's a really um, broad range of, of issues uh, and different modes of, of thinking about ideas and, and how to land them. So uh, I, I'm, the one graphic I probably should have had on a PowerPoint slide is our policy funnel. We always try and think about where, where we are in the policy process, uh, starting with framing ideas uh, and examples there would be coming up with a proposal for an office for carbon removal because there's a, a sort of very little credibility in the carbon offsets market to try to give some credibility to that or uh, work on a land use framework how to get the nature carbon and food that we need out of our finite land space or natural infrastructure schemes how to get private finance into land management including carbon storage so kind of big ideas which people haven't necessarily thought of but then further down the policy funnel you come to uh, policy recommendations so on the natural infrastructure schemes we did a test and trials with defra to actually see if if this kind of bright policy idea was implementable and worked with uh, national trust and a, and a group of landowners in the lake district to to um, try and get that thinking into the government's environmental land management schemes that it was setting up uh, on uh, the agricultural on the, on the land use framework we haven't actually uh, a, a, well there is a, a, a general agreement the government has to introduce the land use framework but we've also come up with um, some quite worked through ideas on what a an agricultural support scheme that supported the aims of a land use framework would be how to incentivize farmers to produce the public goods that uh, that, that we need uh, other examples of policy recommendations would be uh, the commit, commit and review plan for offshore wind uh, some years ago saying to the government if if you commit a certain amount of money to offshore wind on the basis that the industry will bring down the costs and um, that would be a good thing to do and that has been successful beyond anybody's uh, imagination really in terms of how, how cheap off, offshore wind became quite quickly uh, or uh, the idea of an office for environment environmental protection to replace the role that had been played by the European Court and the European Commission after we left the European Union. So, and the, the, the further down the funnel is the um, is advocacy and political engagement. That might be uh, very direct advocacy, working with MPs on bills uh, such as the Environment Bill uh, and indeed uh, with peers, um, or it'd be working with groups of NGOs uh, at the moment, we're working quite closely with the, it's not directly a, car, a climate um, issue, but the uh, you, you will have seen in the last few days, the National Trust has said that the government appears to be uh, declaring a war on nature. And uh, and, and uh, we are working closely with the National Trust, the RSVV and, and others uh, on that campaign. And we also helped set up a new coalition called Warm This Winter, which was, I think, the first really serious collaboration between environmental groups and social groups about how to address the uh, cost of living crisis in a way that's going to ensure there wasn't a cleavage between social and environmental groups. So a particular emphasis in, in the Warm This Winter campaign on insulation, also on immediate support for uh, consumers' bills. So that, that is probably less urgent, um, though still there is still a need for support, but uh, that argument has been won to an extent. Um, in, in all of this, I think the mode that we would work in is 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 very very important uh, to be kind of practical and I, I think Patrick's mentioned and Lord Demons also mentioned the need to make one's uh, thinking understandable. Our target really is policymakers and MPs very largely. We work with a with a group of 
organizations who are reaching out to the general public. I think it's really important that we can demonstrate the public is on side, and I'll say a bit more about that later. But even so, there is no shortage of policy reports. I remember when I first worked for CPRE, somebody suggested there should be a, a, a six month moratorium when nobody wrote any reports so that everybody could read the reports that were mouldering on their desks. Um, so we do try to get our reports boiled down into infographics, quite simple presentations. Uh, and, and indeed, for a short while, Green Lines did sort of ban proper prosy reports. There is a there is a kind of you know, there's a good need for long, chunky, footnoted reports. But if you're trying to get to policymakers and MPs, it's quite often the case that you need a, a punchy report and a, a short meeting or a podcast or or whatever. On science versus social science, I, we we've been really use, really lucky recently in recruiting some fantastic. Uh, scientists with recent PhDs and, and so on. But I think the mode in which you have to operate in the think tank is, is it's in the policy world. And so it is kind of immediately the scientists have to become, if you like, social scientists, if that, if that makes sense. And I, I'm struck by the role that Nick Eyre, who leads CREDS plays as a guy with a, a PhD in nuclear physics, I think, but was a policy head for uh, carbon, uh, I can't remember where he was. Anyway, he, he then made a career as a policy head and I think our, our scientists sort of become social scientists. I say this slightly defensively because when I first started mixing with the chief execs of the environmental organizations, one in particular used to speak so contemptuously of anybody with a degree in PPE who obviously knows nothing. And I was sort of keeping my head down as somebody with a degree in PPE. Um, but I think that, that all, all the very bright scientists uh, do, do have to um, develop social science. And we have recently at Green Alliance trained some of our scientists in economics as well to uh, just a short course to so that they can speak the language of, of policy makers. Um, now, in terms of landing the ideas, I, if I had been giving this talk a couple of months ago, I would probably have said that we, and I don't mean Green Alliance, I mean we collectively have won a serious commitment to net zero, uh, won the argument that is not net zero versus growth, that net zero is a way to get growth, and that we'd won the argument for a, a farming policy based on the principle of public money for public goods, the public goods including a lot of work on uh, cl climate adaptation and, and mitigation. Uh, I think there was a real wake up call we, we had during the Conservative leadership campaign, and I'm not 100% convinced this would be different in any other party where we realized just how uh, shallow was the commitment to net zero with, with one of the candidates talking about uh, net zero being um, uh, unilateral economic disarmament and also how thin was the knowledge base on, on these issues. Uh, Lord Deben said that we assume uh, as a sort of climate community a lot of knowledge. It became clear in the Conservative leadership campaign that people who had been around a long time didn't really have have the facts. I'm also very struck by the fact that when Boris Johnson was asked how he was converted to climate action, he said it was that he had had a briefing from the chief scientist and realized that this stuff was serious. But I was amazed that as he'd managed to be mayor of London for eight years and foreign secretary without having a similar briefing. And, and there is really a, um, a knowledge deficit um, I think, which we, we need to address. I also think there is a challenge for all of us. I, I'm trying not to be too political here, but if you believe in policy-based, uh, sorry, uh, evidence-based policy-making rather than uh, um, policy-based evidence-making, then the last few weeks have not been a great time for, for, for anybody. Uh, it, it's not clear how, how we can use evidence to land, um, to, to land our policy prescriptions. But I, I don't despair because I think the logic of climate action is so strong. And I was really struck. Actually, I've just been at the Labour Party conference in Liverpool and I was struck by speaker after speaker in the environment debate from left and right of the Labour Party, from the unions, from the CLPs, all supporting climate action because it's good for jobs, because it's good for the quality of life, because it's, because it's good for cost of living and so on. All that's positive. Coming back perhaps to some of the stuff Lorraine was talking about. What is missing from that are the hard choices. Nobody was saying that uh, we need to fly less or eat less meat 
or do anything that's particularly difficult. It was the frame was entirely about how climate action can be good for for other other things. So I'll just um, end by saying what what where where this sort of the last month or two of a kind of um, juddering of action on um, on climate uh, on climate has has got us. You know, following I guess the um, hike in energy and food prices following the Ukraine war and now the new government's focus on growth it's still nominal commitment to net zero more than nominal the civil service machine is carrying but it's less of a clearly less of a sort of defining goal of the government and i think we need to go back to some serious work um, which green alliance has been doing for about 10 years we had a climate leadership program training uh, or training that or, or informing mps on the need for climate action in the last couple of years all the MPs, et cetera, so we, we know it, we don't really need it, we're committed. And I think we now realize that we do need to go back, work on that again. And what we particularly need to do is build on some research we did with Lancaster University and um, Professor Becky Willis, who's Professor of Energy and Climate Governance. Uh, she wrote a report for us uh, on building a political mandate for climate action, which really said that MPs sort of know that this stuff's important, but they also don't think it's got any uh, relevance to their day-to-day -day, uh, work as MPs and they also don't feel pressure coming from the cons their constituents. I think that has changed since Becky wrote the report because there is clearly climate uh, has become a kind of top three or four political issue and, and, and the environment more generally. But I, I think we need to sort of redouble our efforts at both the policy prescriptions, which I think are pretty clear. I think we all know in policy terms what we need to do to address this problem and CCC has done a huge amount of work on that which is 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 unimpeachable really but then also make it relevant to the policy makers in a way that they can see has has political benefit uh, as well as benefit for 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 climate climate action so i think that's the challenge of think tanks the challenge of, for think tanks like green alliance working with others in the environment sector who who do have mass membership and and sort of reach out reach out to more people directly so i'll leave it there bobby Thank you.